My question today is about my money mentality. You see, I recently became aware that I'm surrounded by poor people. What I mean is everyone in my life at the moment has a poor person mentality, including me. It feels like my family, friends, and even my partner are stuck in scarcity. They're scrambling for dollars, stressed out about bills, complain about the government stealing from them, and say everyone's got their hands in your pocket. It's gotten to the point where movies are out of the question, date nights don't exist, and there are no more nice dinners. It sucks. So my question is, how do you break out of the scarcity mentality when everyone around you is stuck in it? Should I cut everyone off and move to Greenland? Or do I have to constantly read books about money? Help love Elise. Elise, this is an awesome question, and you are so not alone. Not many people I know grew up with wealth, whether that's actual cash or an abundant money mentality. Now, here is the good news. You can totally break out of your scarcity mentality and create a shift in the energy around you without moving to Greenland. Now, I know you put a lot of emphasis on the people around you, but as you know, the only person you can change is yourself, so that's where we gotta focus. Here are six ways to turn that money frown upside down. Number one, you gotta write yourself a fat reality check. Elise, I know you probably know this, but let me remind you. Almost half the world, that's like three billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. And 80% of all humanity lives on less than 10 bucks a day. Now, I did a little research on you and I'm pretty sure you don't fall into either one of those populations. Now, I'm not making you wrong for wanting more, but you gotta get that true abundance starts with appreciating everything you already have right now. So if you want out of that scarcity mentality, you gotta start appreciating what you got and make it a habit. You've got a roof over your head, you have clean running water, and you have some damn cute clothes. I think Oprah said it best when she said, be thankful for what you have, you'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, you will never ever have enough. Number two, get an ATM. What, steal a cash machine? No silly girl, it's an automatic transformative mantra. That's just a simple phrase you put on automatic repeat that transforms your money mindset. This is something I personally use to overcome my own scarcity mentality around money and I still use it to this day. Here it is. Anytime you part with money, whether you're paying a bill or you're buying something, say this, there's always more where that came from. This might sound silly, but there is real power in the words that we say to ourselves and immense power in rituals. It's a super simple way to retrain yourself in the truth with a capital T about money. Number three, B-Y-O-L, bring your own luxury. Who says you can't have nice dinners at home? In fact, I actually prefer to eat at home. My meals taste way better, they are so much healthier, and they cost a fraction of the price. You can take any inexpensive dinner and make it a nice dinner if you plate it beautifully and you light some candles and you put on some music and you wear something nice. With just a little bit of effort, you can take a cheap dinner and make it an amazing dinner. In fact, one of my favorite resources for budget-friendly recipes is this magazine, cooking light. Number four, start a fun fund. Before we go any further, I gotta say, you and your partner have got to get on the same page about money. Now, you can't change your family or your friends, but it is vital that you and your man get and stay on the same page regarding finances. You can make busting out of your scarcity mentality something you work on together, and the fun fund can help. Here's what that is. It's a checking account or a piggy bank or a pickle jar that's earmarked for fun and fun only. So that money is exclusively for movies or meals out or other things you and your partner might normally say, we can't afford. Number five, build your knowledge bank. Now you said, do I have to keep reading books about money? And my answer, until you get your money game together, yes! And whether it's books or seminars or audios, it's not just about reading or listening, but you actually have to implement it, especially if you wanna have money and keep it. Now, as for money seminars, they can be a little cheesy and people may try and sell you some more stuff, but that doesn't matter. You'll still learn a ton. And what's even more important, you're gonna be around people who are actively improving their own money mentality. Number six is spread the wealth. 
So this is another strategy that I've personally used and it's a little bit counterintuitive. So anytime you're feeling a lack around money, you've got to give some away. So for example, if you catch yourself in major scarcity mode, you should donate a little bit of money to a cause you believe in. Now, if you're not sure where to donate, uh, we have an organization that we love. It's called Kiva and we also have our own lending team and I'll put links below this video so you can check it out. Another way to spread the wealth is to just be generous with your friends and family. There's something amazing about saying, I'll treat, even if it's for something simple like a coffee or a home-cooked meal. Now, as we've discussed, you cannot change your family or your friends around their money mentality, but you can be a living demonstration of a more abundant reality. I am ecstatic. How are you? Oh, I'm so good. So you're on the live call-in show and I'm here with Team Forleo and we are so excited to talk to you today. So let's dive in. What's your question and how can we help you? Well, um, I work full-time and no, I cannot retire for at least three years. I also have a side business where I bake and sell um, healthy dog treats. And I do want to write a book. I mean, I have to write a book because it's just there. It's, it's not going to go away. <laughs> so my question is, do I work at my business uh, so then I can retire in three years and then I can spend more time on a book? Or do I plug away at the book, kind of do everything all at once mm -hmm. and plug away a little bit at the book every, every other day kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, so this is a great question, and I know for many of us, especially when we're multi-passionate entrepreneurs and we have several things that we want to do and bring out in this world, it can feel a little confusing. So I've got some questions for you that'll help me better shape um, our answers and insights so they can be as helpful as possible. So first one, you said that you're not able to retire until about three years. Where you are right now and you imagine yourself retiring, have you set yourself up financially where you're going to retire in three years no matter what? Yeah. Okay. Great. So that retirement thing, that's going to happen no matter what. Looking at the yes. dog treats, are you the dog treat business? Is it a situation where you're like, wow, this dog treat business has to go from where it is right now to like five times or 10 times by the time I retire in order for me to put food on the table? Or is that just more of a dream? It doesn't necessarily have to happen. Uh, no, it's going to happen. I've decided. Woo! I love you, Betty. I like that clarity. Okay, awesome. And then in terms of the book, why do you want to write a book? Tell me more about that. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I keep thinking it's just, it's in me. It's, it's not necessarily a want, it's a need. And what need will be fulfilled when that book is in reality. Relief. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, I don't, yeah, it's kind of hard to explain because it, it's like, I feel I have something to say and I just need to put it out there. And if people want to read it, fine. Even if nobody reads it, I don't care. Great. It's, so for you, it's just about you have something to say and you want to get this out. So it's not necessarily about the money. It's not necessarily about the quote unquote fame. It's not necessarily about how many people read it. For you, it sounds like it's about the act of self-expression and doing this thing you know you must do from your heart. Does that sound about right? Exactly. Okay. Great. So as you know, the two choices that you have, you can either hunker down get this book done, give birth to it, and it's like, hallelujah, Betty's book is done and now you can move on with either retirement or the dog treat business or whatever else is gonna come into your heart that you wanna create. Or the whole act of doing three things at once, which many of us do, that's a very viable way to go as well, meaning you're still working your full-time job, you're chipping away at the book every day, and you're working on your dog treat business. So curious, for you, when do you come most alive? When you have multiple things going at once or when you focus in? If you look back in your life, where do you get not only the most satisfaction but the biggest results? When you focus in or when you have a ton of things going on? Uh, I would say when I have a lot going on, I can't sit still. Sure. 
Absolutely. So does the notion or when you imagine yourself, like if working on the book every single day, even if it were for an hour, and then also putting energy towards your dog business and working your full-time job, does that sound like Betty's dream life, doing all the things? Yeah, it, it, it kind of does. It kind of um, does. Okay, what's the not? What's the part where you're hesitating? Well, I really would love to get rid of the day job. <laughs> okay, we know that. We know that. But the clock is ticking. Three years is not that long of a time. And Betty, you sound like you got a lot of fire and a lot of energy in you. So I'm not worried about you one bit. So you just you wish you could retire a little faster. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, definitely. Okay. Okay. Cool. I'm already taking. Uh, actually, I've. Uh, this year, I we have a, a plan at work where I can take a little less salary, and um, it's called leave income averaging. So I'm taking off from July 12th until September 6th. Amazing. Well, you know, I have heard that there are programs and there are people that help you write a book fairly quickly. You know, when Ooh. I first started my career, I remember I wanted to write a book very bad. And I would go to these different workshops and, um, you know, look at self-publishing, look at traditional publishing. And again, this is like 10 or probably like 15 years ago at this point, probably close to 16, something like that. And I remember coming across quite a different number of opportunities where there was like, write your book in a weekend. Now, I don't know if that was 100% true or that was some marketing, but my point is it doesn't necessarily have to take you so long. And if writing the book is something that you just want to make happen and you want to set that goal, you strike me as the kind of woman, Betty, that when you make up your mind to make something happen, girl, you are going to make it happen. So... One thing I want to suggest for you, do some research online, like get those little hands type and Google it up and look at opportunities, book coaches, programs for where, or even a ghostwriter that someone could help you pull this book out of you. And maybe within a month, three months or six months, you could be sitting with Betty's book in your hand, sharing it with everybody that you know. That's one thing. If you feel like it would be more joyful for you to just crank it out little by little, then you should just start waking up early or staying up late, whatever kind of sits with your body's clock, and just start chipping away at this thing. But I don't think you're conflicted. When I'm looking at your question and I'm hearing you, it's like you just need to hit the road and get it going. And this job is going to take care of itself. Three years is going to go by like that. Yes. Wow. She's going to have a sequel before that. <laughs> yeah. It's like book number two is going to be coming out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you, I know that you had written to us and asked about like maybe a dog book. Hell, if you want to write a dog book woman, do it. But I think that you're clear and I think you just need to sit your ass down, write that damn book and get this going. Yeah. I think, I think what I need is to have someone else say that to me? Yes. <laughs> well, that's true for many of us. I just want to say that I, like, I will raise, I love that Betty's laughing right now, but there's so many times in my life too. I need somebody to tell me exactly what I know in my heart. But why is it sometimes it's more powerful when you hear it from someone else? Because I think in our like inner circles, like everybody's always, we're hoping are going to be on our side and high-fiving us. But when it's from our outside circle, you're like, okay, that's what I needed to hear. Even though it's been said the same way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So Betty- yeah, it's how are you I, feeling I need now? To, I need to go. I need to go by my own motto, and it's like "suck it up, Buttercup." Oh, yes, yes. suck it up, Buttercup. Woo, yes, yes, you just got some confetti thrown to you. Suck it up. Buttercup. So it sounds like you're doing real good, and it also sounds like you're going to be sending us a little follow up email telling us about. I don't know. You're on like chapter seven of your book, mm -hmm. and we want to see some pictures of those dog treats so that we can continue to cheer you on, woman. Oh yeah. Well, I've been posting a lot on Twitter today. Yay. At at Kookies. At K -O -O -K -E -E -Z. Kookies. K-O-O-K-E-E-Z. K-O-O-K-E-E-Z. All right. I love it. I'm a mom of a four-year-old, and I'm expecting my second child later this year. God bless. I'm a fan of your blog. It's been very helpful in the process of adjusting my thinking toward business. Does being ambitious or wanting more success mean you are ungrateful for the current gifts in your life? Is it possible to be fully grateful for the current blessings you have and still pursue the six-figure income, the fame, the entrepreneurship, et cetera, with abandon? Want to know my answer? Do you? Yes! 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 Wait, you know who else says yes? Yes, yes, yes.
Here's the reason why I love this question. I'm so happy that it came up. One of the biggest challenges that most of us go through when we're starting to explore spirituality and discovering the whole idea of being super grateful for what you have is we can feel guilty about wanting more. It's almost as if, oh, I really have to just, you know, be okay with everything I have now, which is great, but it's human to want to create. It's human to want to grow, to want to explore, to expand and take in more. And I just want to make a little note here. You know, wanting more doesn't always equate to materialism. It doesn't always mean toys. You could want to touch more lives. You could want to expand your ability to love. So wanting more in and of itself is nothing that you should shy away from. And I absolutely believe with my heart and soul that you can be extremely grateful grateful for what you have and go balls to the wall with your dreams. So I have a few strategies to share with you that will help you accomplish this. In my lovely book called Make Every Man Want You, How to Be So Irresistible You'll Barely Keep From Dating Yourself, which by the way, we're going to give you a free audio download, Missy, just because you asked such a great question. I talk about a concept called this is it. This is it really means that you treat this moment like it's the most amazing moment of your life. You look around in your world and you just make it the best it can possibly be. So in short, wherever you're at, that's where the party is. So if you find yourself standing in line at a bank and there's a really long line and everyone else is cranky, this is it. This is your moment. So you're going to party with it. You're going to hang out. You're going to have a great time. Talk to people on the line. Really appreciate where you're at. But that doesn't stop you. The whole this is it mentality doesn't stop you from having big dreams that you're also going to pursue. So it's a matter of just finding that balance, but you can absolutely do it. And don't let anyone tell you that uh, you're ungrateful for what you have if you have big dreams and ambitions. So one more little note, and it's about complaining. This is a great way to just basically check yourself before you wreck yourself. Chickity chickity, check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you catch yourself complaining, you've slipped out of the modality of being grateful for what you have, and it's gonna be really hard to really attract great things or be really ambitious or have the energy you need to achieve those big dreams. So use complaining as a bit of a barometer. If you find yourself saying, oh, this sucks, my current client sucks, my boyfriend sucks, blah, 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 not so good. Stop it, don't beat yourself up, but just get back into the grateful mode and keep kicking ass toward your dreams. So Gab, I know this is airing right now. We just were right at the beginning of 2013 and so many people have resolutions at this time of year. They're pumped up, they're ready to like make all these big changes. And uh, I know that May Cause Miracles can help people actually transform their habits and behavior. Tell me more about that. Well, one of my big intentions for this book was to make it really helpful for folks that are ready to make that resolution stick. Because when we hit January 1st, yes. everyone's like, oh, I'm ready to make changes. And they're like <laughs> all psyched about it. And so that's when I want to That sounded like a South Park. That sounded, oh, well, did you want can, me to do Carmen? Can you do? <laughs> so um, we have this experience of wanting to make change. Right. And we're ready for that transformational experience. So for me, it's like jackpot, let's get on these folks now. Let's give them the tools when they're in that place of willingness. Yes. Because that's what most of the book is about, is really opening up to willingness. But January is a hot spot. It's like right when we're all willing to change, we're yes. ready to do something different. And so that's really the first step to having any resolution stick is having the willingness to make it happen. So let's talk about willingness though a little bit more because I find willingness to be this really kind of magical state Hmm. magical kind of tool. Because for me, if I'm hanging on to my point of view or my perspective, there's almost like whenever I've been really bratty, there's no willingness inside me to even have it transform, whatever hmm. my bratty state is, because I'm so committed to my own point of view. And I think that for many of us, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, you know, we say we want change, but we're, we're not really willing to let go of either our behaviors or our way of thinking. And so have you noticed that with your work, like the willingness piece is a bit of magic? Yeah, I think that people have to hit a hard enough bottom to really wake up and say, I'm ready to do this. You yes. know, so it's like for me, I've been on a path of trying to give up coffee for several years and something just hit me. You know, I was given some guidance from one of my spiritual teachers. It was like, you need to clean that up if you want to go big, you know, and sometimes <laughs> there's just those moments when you're like, that was enough of a bottom. Yeah. And that was just a moment for, for me to say, 
I don't want to do that anymore. Right. And so I think that you can't deprive someone of their bottom. They have to have that experience naturally. And there will maybe many moments of just, you know, reverting back to old behavior, reverting back to old behavior until you're really ready to commit. Yeah. But the neat thing about January and New Year's time is that people are kind of like looking back at last year and they're like, oh, I got to do, you know, right. so they're ready to make some change. Yeah. And uh, that's what this is really hopefully going to be a major guide for people to make that change stick. And the main way that the change will stick is because of the repetition. Mm. So you tell know, me about that. You know, all the yogis and the metaphysicians have used these practices, 40 day practices. So when I do a Kundalini meditation, I'll do it for 40 days. And the, the purpose of the 40 days is one, from a neuroscientific perspective, it's literally changing the neural pathways in our brain. You yes. know, we're, we're creating new patterns. And then from a spiritual perspective, it's just uh, the more you call on spirit, the more you call on a higher way of thinking, the more that way of thinking becomes your reality. Reality. Yes. And so it's really just the repetition of a new thought. Love it. Hi, is this Susan? Yes, it is. You it's Marie Forleo. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Hooray. Hi. Yay. So you're on Marie TV. Zach's with me and so is Team Forleo. We are so excited to connect with you today. Oh, oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> so let us know your question and we will do our very best to support you. Okay, I am just turned 50, and um, I have been married for pretty well 35 years, and I'm on my own for the very first time. So I'm just contemplating careers, and my two loves of life are horticulture and medicine. And I'm trying to connect with my inner voice, but I'm just having a real heck of a time doing that right now. Yeah. So I just would like Marie's help. Absolutely. Well, first of all, we are so excited. I'm so excited about this particular question because I think for many of us, especially when you were living life and you had this particular chapter and it was long and you were kind of doing things in certain patterns and then all of a sudden things are fresh and new, it can feel difficult to hear that inner voice. So I'm so thrilled that you're asking this question because you're giving voice to something that I know many, many women and men can struggle with. So a couple things. I wanna let you know that all of us can doubt our age at any time. So it's not okay. just about you turning 50, which by the way, congratulations. Um, <laughs> young folks, you know, in our teens, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I think that self-doubt is really a natural part of who we all are and it helps us ask those important questions so we can find that clarity. So just one note about that. And then I also want to say I'm really excited because 50 right now, you're barely even at the midpoint, mama. You have got so mm. much exciting life in front of you, like really. Cool. So you, I want you to take that in because it's true. You know, lifespans are expanding. We're living longer. We're living healthier. We have so many more things that we can do in this one big glorious life. So I want you to get excited because I know a lot of women in your age range and older, and they, many of them tell me like, oh my goodness, it just keeps getting better and better. So I just want to set that frame for you as well, that it's not on the down you know, hill, this is on the uphill. You're still on your way up. And the third thing I want to share with you, I don't know if you saw this episode, but after we get off this call, please do me a favor. I want you to Google okay. search Marie TV plus late bloomers. We have this okay. incredible episode where we've profiled these 10 badass women who started new careers, new passions later in life, most of them over 60, some in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even above that. And I think you're going to find not only a lot of inspiration there, but a lot of hope and perhaps even some ideas. So that's that. But I know your question was around how to find your inner voice. And mm -hmm. I want to give you a couple of exercises that I think will help. One, okay. my dear, how physically active are you right now? Like, would you say that you work out every single day? Is it once a week? Talk to us about how much physical activity you tend to do at this stage. Well, that's something I'm working on right now because Great. Um, in the past four years, I've had my struggles with my, um, with my health. And, um, I, I'm at that point too, where I'm regaining it and, um, trying to get physical, but it's just one of those things that, you know, just making that first 
step is so difficult. Yes. And I, even though I know what importance it holds in all aspects, even in my mental health, it's yes. still getting there. Yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm going to invite you to put that as a higher priority. And I particularly love dance. I feel like when I dance, and it can be any music that you love, it doesn't have to be a specific style of dance. You don't have to follow choreography. You can just move your body. Even if you Mm -hmm. put on two to three of your favorite songs in your house and you just let yourself move around with absolutely no self-consciousness, no awareness of how you look, just enjoying the music and enjoying movement, the reason why I'm suggesting this for you is because I find that many of us are cut off from a lot of the wisdom that lives in our bodies. And when we move, we get that emotion in motion and all of a sudden a huge channel opens up to our intuition, to creative ideas to all types of insights that I've found cannot be accessed any other way, not through meditation, not through talking, not through writing, not through anything else. So I would invite you, my love, if one of your goals is to hear more clearly your inner voice and your heart's desire is to make it a priority to move. That could even mean walking outside in nature. If you like working out at home, you know, it could be just following free videos on YouTube. There's also wonderful apps. There's so many different possibilities. But for me, movement is a must. It is a must Mm -hmm. to hear that calling in your heart, to be able to feel what this next chapter is going to be for you, and then also to have the energy and the excitement to move towards it. So that's piece number one. Okay. The second piece, and it's cool too, because you're just using um, this incredible asset that you already have, which is this vessel called your body. The second Mm -hmm. little exercise I want you to try is with a journal and with writing, because I find that that's another vehicle to hear what your soul is calling for. And the sentence stem I'm going to give you is something that we also did a Marie TV about, and it's something that we use in our company and that I use when I set my own goals and when I want to reach higher. The sentence stem is this, wouldn't it be cool if? So for you, Susan, wouldn't it be cool if I got to spend some time studying medicine, even if it was five hours a week? Wouldn't it be cool if I got to visit X, Y, and Z? And again, you can just keep finishing that sentence in your journal, on a piece of paper, and anything that pops up into your mind or heart, even if it sounds outrageous, even if it sounds ridiculous, even if it sounds like something you have no idea how you would make that come to life, please write it down. For so many of us, especially women, our voices, both exterior voices and our inner voices, have been silenced for so long. So it takes some unearthing to be able to hear it. And one of the best ways to do that is to just let yourself go nuts on that page, to let yourself dream wildly, to explore all different kinds of possibilities, and then to start to feel from the inside out which ones give you goosebumps, which ones go, oh, I'm surprised that that came out. And you know what? I might want to play there. I might want to go take that class or make that phone call or look up something on the internet and see how I can bring that dream to life. So between movement and writing and watching that awesome Marie TV episode about late bloomers, I think that you are going to give yourself a real concrete next step to getting back in touch with that inner voice that's already in there that is longing to be heard. I keep having arguments with it is what it is. <laughs> oh, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what those arguments are? Social mm-hmm. conditioning. Okay. All of the years, all of the voices, both internal and external, that told you that you can't, that told you that women should be a particular way, that told you you're not good enough or smart enough or talented enough or capable enough or whatever enough to have mm-hmm. this dream of yours. And so I lived it. Yes, that's right. So my darling, this is your opportunity to get back in touch with the real you that has always been there and to break through every internal and external voice that has said no. This is your chance Mm -hmm. to say yes to you. This is what this next chapter of your life can be. And you have all the tools you need right now to bring it to life. Yeah. You are just reaffirming everything that I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. Actually, it's just too ironic. 
synchronicity, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I've been actually journaling for the last two weeks, something oh, I've awesome. never done in my life. So, yeah, that's something new for me, and it's really bringing me some insight as well. Um, and also, I started walking, and yeah, I've lost 20 pounds so far. And, Come on, Mama! You're getting some confetti throws and you're getting some claps from all the team. I'll I'll add one more piece onto this. Please keep paying attention to what sounds really fun and what feels really joyful to you, even if it seems frivolous. Like even if you find yourself walking and you come across a little store and it's like a five and dime and you go in there and you're like, oh, wow, these stickers. Like, oh my goodness, these stickers. I don't know why, but I'm going to pick up these stickers because they look like fun and they bring my heart a smile. Or you walk down and you see a restaurant that you've never gone in before and something pulls you in there and you just want to have a little cup of soup because it feels like it'll warm your soul. Like pay attention to what draws you to it because I found that there are certain things that we're attracted to that may not fit our picture of who we are or what we should like, but those things that we're drawn to are tied to our deeper purpose. And that's the Mm. adventure that you're on right now of learning how to reconnect with your desire and to activate and live through that. So I'm really excited for you, my love. You just sound, she sounds so open to all the possibilities. Yes, absolutely. And I love that you're going to be dancing in your apartment. Yeah. I think that's good. I mean, that to me grounds me all the time when I, and I get in my head too. Yeah. And when I just start dancing, it's almost like a, Fuck you to all the negative voices out there, you know? <laughs> it's just like I'm dancing just to go to hell with them, you know? Yeah. No, I like it. Yeah. Susan, are you willing to play? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and if, if, if I don't have to set foot into a gym, hey, I'm all for it. Yes. There are so many different ways to get that beautiful body of yours moving and moving and moving without necessarily touching a gym. Chapter 14 talks about the right and wrong way to manifest. And I thought Mm. this was really awesome because, again, for folks like you and I who tend to then attract folks like you and I, meaning (laughs) very hard workers, people who put their nose to the grindstone, we get it done no matter what, right? (laughs) Even if you don't like the word manifesting, just this notion of having more ease in your life, of bringing things into your life that you don't necessarily Mm -hmm. pound your face against the ground for every single day until your eyeballs fall out. So talk to me about a little bit of the the wrong way and the right way to manifest for those who may want a little more ease. Yeah. Great question. So let me um, draw a distinction between the importance of dreaming and uh, the power of manifesting. So dreaming in terms of not what you're doing at night, but dreaming and giving yourself permission to desire things to have incredible, magical things occur in your life. Giving yourself permission to let your mind, body, and spirit wander into the future and to imagine a life that really lights you up. That's so important because those dreams are deeply connected to your soul. Like you you won't dream about something that's not meant for you. I'm not dreaming right now about a uh, penthouse apartment in New York City. I don't want to live there right now. So that's not going to come to me. But, you know, when you allow yourself and your mind and spirit to wander forward and just allow yourself and give yourself permission to imagine, what's amazing is you plant a beacon out into the future. And that beacon, whether it's a beach house or it's a loving relationship or it's uh, healing past trauma or it's launching your dream business or it's just waking up and being happier and healthier and surrounded by all these amazing people. Whatever that dream is, you got to allow yourself to dream it because it acts as a mechanism that starts to pull you toward it and it it will pull you through your fear. It will create tension in your life because it's going to make you start to wake up and pay attention to it. That's where a vision board comes in. And a vision board, yeah, Most of us make a vision board and we put up the beach house or the Range Rover or the amazing log cabin or the trip to Disney World or the dream business that we want, whatever it is the things are that we want, the loving relationship. But then this is where we make the biggest mistake because manifesting isn't the dream. Manifesting is the bridge between where you are and where you want to go. 
Mm. Manifesting is the bricks that form the pathway that connect you there. And most of us have been led to believe that we need to sit quietly and with vibrational force feel ourselves sitting on the deck of that beach house and how it's going to feel when the wind is in our hair. And what happens when you do it that way is that you socialize your mind and body to the end. When the fact is, it's going to be a bazillion little irritating steps that get you there. Yes. And we skip that part. So uh, I love this. I, I just want to underscore this because when we were doing the Everything is Figure Outable book tour and I did this event and I had people close their eyes and visualize themselves figuring it out, whatever their their dream was, we actually did that. I was like, I want to see, I want you to see yourself taking those steps. And I loved how you broke this down in the book. I thought it was so great because yeah, it's one thing to go, yay, we crossed the finish line and there's the house or the relationship or the health or the trip or whatever. Right. But to rehearse in your mind's eye, emotionally, visually, intellectually, seeing yourself doing the steps. So if it's writing mm -hmm. a book, you know, sitting at your table and maybe sweating a little because you don't think you're a very good writer, but showing up anyway, or getting up when the alarm yep. goes off and putting your sneakers on and all of those different little micro actions, even if it's a healthy relationship. For me, there's been times where if what I want to shift and change is a reaction that I've had to something, seeing myself... Mm with the same situation that could trigger me in the past and visualizing myself behaving differently, feeling differently, watching it. Those are the steps that help me create that shift where it yes. actually happens. So I just yes. wanted to praise you, acknowledge you, and underscore how awesome this is because your mind is so powerful. Our brains are so incredibly miraculous, but we're not given the instruction kits on yes. how to use them. Yes, exactly. So, you know, you want to launch a business, visualize yourself telling your friends you can't come out tonight because you're going to work on something. Visualize yourself hitting that post and then feeling the fear that people are going to judge you when you start posting about something different than your kids or your dream vacations and you start posting about your business. Visualize yourself spending a Saturday while the kids are playing soccer working on something. Visualize yourself hearing no and feeling discouraged and then picking up the phone and making the next phone call. There's something called the Zygarnik effect in your brain. It's like a little to-do list, a checklist that your brain keeps intact in your mind. And your brain, once you start to socialize your mind, body, and spirit to all these little irritating steps, like you want to run a marathon, don't visualize the finish. Visualize yourself at mile 11 on a training run, and it starts to rain, and your earbud batteries die, and you keep going. Yes. When you do that, what you're doing is you're smoothing out your resistance to all this work that it's going to require to make this stuff happen. Because you are capable. You can figure it out. And you can use uh, simple tools backed by science to lower the resistance in your body and mind to actually doing the things that you've never done before. Are you ready to create your own success story? If so, I've got a free coaching tool for you. It's called How to Get Anything You Want. It's an awesome audio. It'll give you three simple steps to create your dreams on your terms. All you need to do to get it is go to marieforleo.com slash subscribe. That's marieforleo.com slash subscribe. See you there. Are you only getting a fraction of what you want in your business and life? Are the things that you're looking to achieve taking way too long to come your way? If so, Gabby Bernstein may have your answer. In fact, she says that to manifest anything you want in your business, whether it's career goals, maybe it's relationships, your health, your happiness, the real work is an inside job. I am so thrilled today to bring you my dear friend and best-selling author, Miss Gabby Bernstein. Yeah! Can you believe you're on Marie TV? I know. I was saying I was like on Oprah today. Yeah, <laughs> It's just like being on Oprah. This is awesome. So manifesting is such a cool topic. Um, it's something that a lot of people may have some resistance to mm -hmm. if they think it's like a little too woo-woo and it's a little too passive. And I know for me in my life, 
Um, I'm such a go-getting kind of driven girl that in the past I used to have my own resistance to it. But as I've become older and a little more mature, um, I've opened my mind and I actually do consider myself quite a good manifester. Yes. So for our audience, can you define what exactly is manifesting? Manifesting is acquiring the experience of what it is that you want to feel mm -hmm. and being and living and believing in that experience and then allowing that experience to come into form. So not only the experience like say um, wanting to go on a vacation, but even if you want something like a new MacBook Air, mm -hmm, <laughs> you can manifest mm -hmm. uh, a new computer or, Absolutely. or being a published author or having your business reach a certain level. So everything falls into that. Everything, everything falls into that category. Sometimes we manifest things far beyond our wildest dreams. Yep. So sometimes if we have a vision of something, it happens in a far greater way. So we want to stay open. Yep. So we can say, I want that MacBook Air, but maybe we get that MacBook Air that's a little bit bigger than we thought. You yeah, know, or maybe it comes with an extra little gift. Yeah, but allowing ourselves to be open this or something more. Cool. So uh, the way that I think about manifesting too, it's it's also it's involved in the process of of creation or creating. You know, I consider myself an artist and a creator. Do you see like a distinction between manifesting and creating? Manifesting is very creative. It is the process of using your power energy and being in that presence of your high powered energy and allowing that energy to co-create with the energy that's around you. So you're vibrating at a high frequency. I'm vibrating at a high frequency. Ooh, We've done a lot of work. We've yep. cleaned up a lot of our own crap. We yep. believe in ourselves today. Yep. And that, that energy of believing in ourselves has attracted us together today and brought us into this space where we together are co-creating and teaching. If I hadn't cleaned up my side of the street and if I didn't believe in myself the way I do, I would never have manifested being on Marie TV. <laughs> That's very true. Mm -hmm. So I know I like to always believe that I'm co-creating with the universe because there, I really believe there are no um, such things as coincidences. And I've had too many experiences in my life where I'm like, oh my God, that's what I wanted. And it all seemed to line up and it was incredible. So that's really part of what we're talking about here, right? Is, is our ability to, to play an active role, but almost paradoxically a passive role in helping things that we want come into our life. Yeah, there's a, there's a really nice line from uh, A Course in Miracles, which is the metaphysical text I teach. And it is, miracles occur naturally, and when they're not occurring, something has gone wrong. That's mm -hmm. interesting. It's a good one, right? So what happens is, is that that synchronicity, that flow, that effortless action, that just sort of allowing, oh, I was thinking about that and it just showed up. That's how life is supposed to be. Mm. We get in the way. Our negative belief systems, our fears, our anxiety, our, our anger towards the past, that future tripping and projecting, all of that energy gets in the way of allowing all of the miracles to occur naturally. So this is awesome. So what I like to do on Marie TV, which you know, because I know you watch us every week, is to take this, an idea or a concept and really break it down and make it super actionable. So if someone has never heard of manifesting, or maybe they have, but they've been quite a skeptic and are like, this is BS, this stuff doesn't work. Can you break it down like how, how to manifest? Like what's the first thing that we should be doing? So the first type of manifestation is to get very, very clear. And you know, if we're not clear about what we desire, then we can call in some really funky stuff. Yeah, this is big. And I just want to interrupt you for a moment because like one of the things that I say again and again when I'm working with clients, I can help you get anything you want, but you have to tell me what that is. Yep, that's it. <laughs> you know, and that's clarity it. is really, it's that secret key. Because you're like a manifestation can opener. If somebody gets clear about what they want. <laughs> that's really funny. Uh, that's your new name. Oh, that's my new title. I'm a manifestation can opener. Yes, go but for it. It's true because if somebody gets really clear about what they want, your work is just releasing all the blocks yeah. and all the disbelief. Yeah. And so if you're clear, first and foremost, you must be clear. Yep. And, and you must be clear because if you are unclear, you'll start to call in some things that are not really what you want. Yeah. You'll be confused. Uh, the other piece is that once you're clear, you can also then get clear about all of the ways that you don't believe. All of the limiting beliefs, all of the negativity that might be blocking you. Oh, this is good. So let's use an example. Let's take it from the top. So I know for both of us, this is something we share. Um, you're a published author, I'm a published author, and I know many people in the world, it's one of their dreams to have their own book out on the shelf. So I know you must have gotten clear at one point, I am going to be a published author, right? Mm -hmm. So clarity, step number one. Yes. Number two, getting clear on everything that's 
preventing that, right? You're, yes. you're limiting beliefs. So yeah. tell, we're, tell us some of yours when you first had that clarity. Well, I often joke that I was a published author three years before I actually was a published author yeah. because I believed so deeply. But of course there was disbelief and there was actually a period in my life where it was right when the recession hit. My stepfather says to me, I'm telling him all about my book that I wanted to bring into the world. And he said to me, well, you know, it's a really tough time. It's going to be really hard because we've got resistors. You know, people just having a hard time with the realities of the world. Yeah. And saying, oh, well, you're going to have a hard time getting your book published. And I looked at him with so much conviction and so much faith. And I said, I believe in miracles. I believe I am a published author. One month later, my first book was published. So that faithfulness, that, that belief system is what allows it to come into the reality that we live. But what we must understand is that I had done quite about a, a significant amount of work mm -hmm. to release all of the limiting beliefs that I had been holding on to. A limiting belief. I have eighth grade English. I have never written anything beyond eighth grade. Yes. I had to teach myself how to write. Yeah. So the limiting belief, which I'm not a writer, I don't know how to write. That was yes. a major one for me to overcome. So this is great. So we have step one and step two. It's getting clear on the thing that you want. And then also having the courage to really look inside and see all the limiting beliefs that can be holding you back from that. Okay, good. So we've And got then clean them up. And then clean them up. Okay, awesome. Tell me. So is that, can that be as simple of as recognizing that it's a story you're telling yourself? It's yes. Just simply doesn't have to be the truth. Yes, the healing process of anything can just be the witnessing of, okay, that's not working. That limiting belief is holding me back. And mm -hmm. when we wake up to that call of that's not working, that's when teachers like you come into our life. That's when books fall off the shelf. That's when we land on Marie TV because we're tooling around YouTube, <laughs> right? So we are led to what we need to heal. So the first point is just to recognize how you are blocking yourself and trust that the universe will give you exactly what you need to heal those limiting beliefs. Awesome. Okay, so we've got our two steps. Is there a third step? So now we're in the process. So we're healing. We're healing our limiting beliefs. We're active, we're engaged, we're aware. We're what getting we into next? the know. We're getting yeah. into the know. Okay, so mm -hmm. step three, step three is getting into the know. Know the universe has your back. Love that. Mm -hmm. my, I think my mug says it. The universe knows. Awesome. <laughs> Tell me more about what okay. that means. So uh, what happens when we get into the know is that we have released, that we're working on releasing that disbelief and that's a daily process. And the more we let go of that disbelief, the more we begin to acquire the presence of what it feels like to be in that manifestation. So the same way I was saying I was a published author, I felt like a published author years before I was a published author. I felt abundant even when I was scrapping to get by. Yeah. I still felt the presence of abundance, which has allowed abundance to come into my life. And I think that's probably the hardest part for all of us. And I can, I can almost hear our audience members, you know, again, we're in 188 countries around the world. So some people are going like, okay, that all sounds cool, but if I don't have any money, right? If I don't have any resources, if people don't believe in me, mm -hmm. what can I do on a daily basis? Is it just a matter of saying, I, I really know this and just honestly having that leap of faith and saying, You've, I've got to stay in this state? You cannot let your outside world dictate your internal condition. The outside world will reflect your internal condition. So if you are letting the outside stuff tell you I'm not good enough, then you are manifestation mishap. You are not allowing yourself to co-create. So I'm going to pause there just for a second. A manifestation mishap, which you guys know, I love cute phrases for things. Um, a manifestation mishap would be uh, thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm having this clarity. I want to be a published author, but what would the mishap be there if they were... Well, but my outside experience is not reflecting that. How yes. am I going to get published? I don't have enough. And all of that is like really not supporting your desire. Got it. So the, the most important point here is to not let the outside world dictate your internal condition. Your internal condition will support your external experiences. So your work is to focus on the internal. And, and I've done that in many cases in my life, like, you know, picking up quarters to pay my gas money. And in that presence of not having a lot of money, I still felt abundant. I did all that work to release my disbelief. And in that presence of believing in my abundance, I've allowed a tremendous amount of abundance to come into my life. So we got to hold the energy and let the outside world reflect that amazingness inside. Okay, so another piece of resistance that could be coming towards us right now from the audience, from someone saying, hey, you know what, I've, I've manifested before or I'm in this process, but you know, it's taken a long time. I've been in the knowing, I'm affirming, but it just ain't here yet. What would you say to someone like that who is just going like, when is it gonna come? When mm -hmm. is this really gonna happen? The most important step in the manifestation process is patience. And there's another beautiful line from A Course in Miracles, which is, those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait and wait without anxiety. 
I freaking love this. And I'm going to make her say it again because it was that beautiful. Gab, say it one more time. Those who are certain of the outcome can afford to wait and wait without anxiety. Love that. Mm -hmm. So when we have that presence of being certain, that certainty, mm -hmm. I am a published author, that man is on the way, I am abundant. When we have that certainty, we can allow, we can be patient, we can be in the know. And another manifestation mishap when you're not patient is that you're controlling, you're grasping, you're manipulating, and you are therefore blocking the natural order. You're blocking the positive energy to flow towards you because you're vibrating a frequency of negative energy because you're in fear, you're controlling and manipulating. Love that. Mm. So this is all really good stuff. Can you give us a quick recap? Again, our little manifesting how to mm -hmm. for anyone out there who's, this is all new to them. First is clarity. Yep. Become very clear about what it is that you desire so you don't call in some crazy crap. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. The next piece is to be clear about all the limiting beliefs that are blocking you from believing and knowing that you are worthy of what you desire. And that takes some courage. You that takes be courage. It takes some time. And that willingness, you just wake up and say, I am willing. I'm ready to have that guidance come forward and you'll be led to teachers like Marie. And then the third step is to be in that presence, in that energy of knowing that you are ready to receive, that you are in that presence of believing and knowing, I am a published author, I am abundant, I am exactly what you want. And having the patience. And then the final step is the patience, to be really relaxed, released, and allow, and stay in the know, letting the universe bring you exactly what it is that you desire. It's awesome, really, really great stuff. If you've ever lost motivation because you're afraid your dreams are just too unrealistic, this one is for you. Today's question comes from Brie, who writes, Hey Marie, you're such an inspiration. I so respect your advice. Thank you. Here's my situation. My whole life I've had big dreams and lots of ambition. Then this little word started to pop up from people around me unrealistic. For example, I wanted to work in publishing and was told that was unrealistic. There were so many obstacles and so few jobs. However, I now work for the second largest publishing company in the world. But there's a new dream I want to pursue, and I can already hear the cacophony of voices in my head insisting this dream is unrealistic. A certain level of realism is necessary, but too much can create self-doubt. So Marie, how do I handle not only hearing from others how unrealistic my dream is, but also not let myself drown out my own desires? Thank you so much, Brie. I love this question so much, Brie. Every single one of us who both dreams and creates things faces voices of dissent, both from people that we know, from people that we don't know, and very often the most deadly comes from within. And if we don't take a thoughtful, conscious approach to taking on our unrealistic dreams, they just ain't gonna happen. But if you are up for the challenge, and I think you are, here are five steps that can help. Step number one is frame your dream. And here's what this means. We can't become what we can't envision. So when I say frame your dream, what I mean is I want you to take a picture of it in your mind's eye in vivid, specific detail. And then what I want you to do is translate that picture into words, meaning write down that big unrealistic dream. And I know that you may have heard about the power of writing things down before, but the truth is most people just don't do it, which is so crazy because the research is conclusive on this. There was a study done by Dr. Gail Matthews that shows that you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. So what I want you to do is whip out your journal or hop on that keyboard and get writing. Step number two is filter opinions and fend off negativity. You've got to take responsibility for the energy that you allow in your life. I want you to fend off negativity as much as humanly possible. You know, we know so much more about the brain than we did just 20 years ago. Neuroscience has taught us incredible things, like that our brains are continuously shaped by our thoughts and our experiences. And you know this to be true. I mean, negativity is one of the most toxic forces on the planet. It's toxic for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your ability to stay motivated. So do me this favor, okay? Do not solicit or listen to the opinions of people who are notorious for just being Debbie Downers. The one mistake that I've seen people make consistently is they almost habitually talk to the exact 
person who is the most likely to shoot them down and make them feel like crap. So don't do that. And here's another key. I want you to always, always, always consider the source. Meaning, don't put a lot of stock into other people's opinions unless they're actually out there consistently taking risks and being brave and actually making things happen. I mean, if you think about it, let's say, I don't know, you wanted to climb Mount Everest. Would you ever take advice from someone who's never even attempted the summit? No, of course not. That would be crazy. So don't take advice from anyone unless you really think it through. And I want you to ask, has this person achieved an unrealistic or impossible dream? Are they taking meaningful risks on a consistent basis? Do you admire who they are, how they live, and what they contribute? If not, do not use them as a sounding board for your idea. Step number three is flood yourself with positive examples. So once you've removed the negative outputs as best as you can, step number three is all about feeding your mind and surrounding yourself with positive stories on a consistent basis of other people who have achieved unrealistic dreams. So think about Helen Keller, for example, who was blind and deaf by the age of two, yet with the help of teachers, she created this extraordinary literary career, writing hundreds of speeches and essays and books. And there are thousands of biographies at the library or even on Netflix. And the great thing that I love about biographies is you also get a chance to witness other people's stumbles and their falls and all the failures that they experience along the way, which of course... Stumbles and falls and failures, those are inevitable for all of us. And you know, it's worth noting that just about anyone whose achievements are worthy of a biography or a documentary probably had an unrealistic dream. So do this for me. Feed your mind examples of people who speak out and stand up for what they believe in and make change happen. Step number four is fast forward. So if you've watched the show for any amount of time, you know this, I love end of life studies. And here's what we know for a fact. When you're on your deathbed, you couldn't care less about what anybody who says your dreams are unrealistic says. I mean, Bronnie Ware's research tells us this very, very clearly, that the single biggest regret people have when they're about to pass is this. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected of me. So Brie, my friend, stop worrying about what other people might think or say about how unrealistic your dream is. It really does not matter. The only thing that matters is what you do about it now. Step number five is focus on action. So this, my friend, is the most important step of all. Action is the antidote to fear. And you don't have to take perfect action. You just need to take any action, brick by brick, inch by inch, step by step. That is how all great things are achieved. And you know my mantra, I believe everything is figure outable. And the best way to figure anything out is through action-based learning. So one more thing before we wrap up, Brie. Unrealistic dreams are totally where it's at. That's where all the growth and the excitement in life comes from. After all, what other kind of dreams are there? Dreams like this? Marie, you will not believe the dream I had last night. So reasonable. I'm shopping, I'm getting all my normal vegetables, but they didn't have avocados. I asked the manager, he brought me some from the back. So realistic, so inspiring. Wow, that uh, sounds inspiring. I mean, you could do that. I think, I think you can make that happen. So Brie, there you have it. Five steps to help you bring your unrealistic dreams to life. And if you ever start to waver, remember this tweetable. If someone tells you your big dream is unrealistic, that's a sure sign you should go for it. Hi Marie, I've been beating myself up because I haven't made a lot of progress in my business for a very long and humiliating time. I finally discovered a huge reason that I'm not moving forward and it's because I'm afraid of the trappings of success. You see, freedom is my number one value and I'm afraid that becoming successful will overwhelm me and take away my freedom instead of giving me more. 
This fear paralyzes me. And even though I'm not handling much right now, I'm already feeling overwhelmed and tired. Any thoughts, tips, or tricks would be greatly appreciated. Shauna, P.S. UF and Rock. UF and Rock too, Shauna. So Shauna, this is an awesome question. I know many people, millions of people struggle with this, including myself. I've often had that same belief that more success could equal less freedom. And it's not a great feeling to have. And to help answer today's question, I've brought one of my very dear friends, Dr. Kathy Collat is here with us today. And uh, you're gonna love Dr. Kathy because not only is she amazingly smart, she is an Oxford grad, but she is a metaphysician and manifesting consultant. And what that means is she helps people create powerful, lasting change in their lives. And one of the ways that she does that is through working with the power of the subconscious mind. Ooh, this is so good, woman. This is so yeah. good. Thank you so much, first so of all. So happy to be here. For being on Marie TV. So um, it sounds like Shauna is having a little bit of trouble between what she consciously wants, which is growing her business, and it sounds like she has a fear of success. Is that what you heard? Definitely sounds that way, right? So we can we can hear the tension or the major conflict between her conscious goal, building a successful business, and her subconscious fears about how that might limit her freedom. So Kathy, tell us why our subconscious minds have so much power over us. Well, the reason is, is it's estimated that approximately about 3% of your processing power is your conscious mind. The rest of it, the other 97%, subconscious, autonomic, automatic, you don't think about how you digest food. You don't normally think about how you breathe. All your habits go on automatic pilot. So by far, our greatest processing powerhouse is our subconscious mind. Scientists will tell you that the power of the subconscious is perhaps a million times greater of the conscious, than the conscious mind. That's amazing. A million times greater. Yeah. And the point of that is not to say that your ego and your will are weak. They are extremely powerful. The point is to recognize that as powerful as they are, there exists an asset within us that is even more powerful than that. So that's why I work with the subconscious mind and why I encourage other people to get their subconscious mind on board in trying to make what they want happen in their lives. We normally try to make what we want happen through our conscious determination and our ego and our sweat, blood, and tears, right. which is tough going as is. And I'm very familiar with that, which right. you've helped me with. Right. So, But especially when it's going over and against something in the other 97%, it becomes a task of Sisyphean proportions. You remember Sisyphus, right? The king in Greek mythology who was punished to an eternity of rolling a boulder up a hill, right, only like, to watch it roll back down again. Right. So this is a version of what Sean is experiencing. Her, or her, rather, her conscious mind might be saying, I want success. Right. Hopefully it is also saying, I am worthy of success. But if something in the other 97% say, thinks otherwise, I don't want success, that's what she's gonna be getting or manifesting. At minimum, she's going to find her somewhere on that Sisyphean mountain trying to push her boulder named success up to the top or prevent the backslide. So Kathy, if your subconscious mind is that powerful, it almost seems like it's the boss and like Shauna would almost need like her boss's approval to sign off on something that she wants. Is that right? I see why you would say that because at a power a million times greater than the conscious mind, it's clear who's going to win, right? Right. But the truth is that Shauna is meant to be the boss. She's meant to be you know, she's meant to manage this asset, this most effective, powerful, and efficient employee by giving it good and clear direction. So if you think of your subconscious as a, a computer, right. you understand that it's going to take its programming and run with it. Right. And it's your job to make sure that its programming is in functional, if not optimal, alignment with your goals. And you do this by programming, reprogramming, and debugging at regular intervals and in concert with those goals as you become aware of them, as they change, and so on. So the great news is that once you get your subconscious on board, mm -hmm. that Sisyphean mountain turns into a molehill. Much like instituting your habits, you don't actually even institute them, doesn't take a lot of thought, doesn't take a lot of effort, you just kind of do them. That's the power of your subconscious mind, and that's the power of the asset that we're all born with. And your job as president and CEO of yourself and your life is to get the most out of this most dependable, and capable employee that you will ever have at your disposal. So it's much, it's much less about asking for permission yeah. than it is about gaining mastery and being adept. 
Kathy, this is so exciting and I love talking about this with you. So it sounds like that Shauna really can get her subconscious mind in alignment with her conscious goals. And I know because you and I have worked together and how brilliant you are, that you give people very clear steps. So can you share with us the clear steps to get your subconscious mind in alignment with your conscious goals? Sure. So step one after you recognize the resistance is to be humble. Don't assume you know anything, let alone everything about your resistance. You want to trust the subconscious long enough to learn from it. You want to trust that it has something intelligent and wise to say, because it does. Uh, Shauna's, for example, is reminding her of her non-negotiable desire for freedom. Kathy, I love that. So in essence, what you're saying is it's about listening to the wisdom that we can find in our resistance. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So what's step two? So step two is to get specific. What is the fear or fears exactly? What are the associations with having or getting what you want? What exactly is it that the subconscious is looking out for? You want to interview your subconscious like you would anybody you're trying to get information from, which is with genuine curiosity and compassion. You want to let it make its case. You want to hear its case because there is priceless wisdom and information in there for you. So it's not enough, for example, for Shauna to know that she's afraid of the trappings of success, much less afraid of success in general. She wants to know what trappings specifically, what freedoms in particular does she think she's going to have to sacrifice for success. Is it more projects? Is it more people depending on her? This will tell her more about what she wants. So step two is to get details and applaud whatever you find. Applaud it before you judge it. Because you, you know, what you normally associate with you, is by far not the smartest thing within you. The next step, step three, would then be to make a promise, right? You want to set the intention to work it out with your subconscious, not to work against it. I love that. So Shauna's fear is saying to her, look, I'm afraid that if you become successful, you're going to be tied to your desk, you're going to be on the phone all day, you're going to be even more stressed out and strapped out, have no fun, have no time for family and friends and love and everything else you want in life. Right. Shauna, uh, Shauna can make her fear a non-issue non by making a promise. Listen, friend, I hear you, I understand what you're saying, and I really appreciate you looking out. If greater success means greater strain, more exhaustion, having less freedom and time for myself in my life, I won't do it. I will only do it if that's not what it means, I promise. And then, of course, she wants to be a good partner in crime for herself to rely on, which right. means to keep her promise. But in any case, by making this promise, you see the tension is dissipated right. and it and makes space for herself and her subconscious to open up to the idea of success and to pursuing it. Kathy, this is so delicious and I'm just, I like want to eat you up right now. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing you say is through making the promise, it's about honoring what is truly important to ourselves and making a commitment to ourselves to really honor that wisdom and honor what we truly want in our lives. So what's step four? Step four is to get examples. So evidently Shauna's subconscious has a lot of uh, negative examples about what happens when you become successful. She wants to douse her subconscious in positive examples and case studies. People whose lives have improved as a result of their success in business. People whose freedom has increased as a result of their success. People who have built successful businesses and have more time to do what they love. Marie is a great example in this respect. I mean, it's part of the mission statement to help women live rich, happy, and hot, right? Yes. Complete opposite of overworked, exhausted, and crushed by the weight of their duties, obligations, and desk. Yes. So she wants to find examples. Can be people she knows, people she doesn't know, famous people, doesn't matter. The point is to let the subconscious know what's possible, to let it know that it is possible to marry or to satisfy all sides of her heart and mind. Um, the subconscious will do anything that you tell it it's possible. So the more examples that she finds and gives, the more she encourages and reinforces the idea this is definitely possible and lets her subconscious know what it's working towards. Oh, this is getting better and better. Do we have, so we have one more step to go, we right? one more step. Step five. Step five is to solidify and affirm. So the more you ingrain your new perspective in your subconscious, the more you can capitalize on its power and its resources to facilitate and even to execute towards your goal on your behalf which of course right means it's easier to materialize, to manifest it, to get what you want. So a good affirmation for Shauna is 
Success increases my freedom in life. I love that. Success increases my freedom in life. Right. Perfect for all of us. And more than an affirmation, because an affirmation, right, it, it implies a kind of I have to defend or I'm proving something, and, and so there's an element of doubt. Right. You really want to think about it like a reminder. It is a reminder. It's a reminder of what is possible. It will also serve as a reminder of the road, the only road in light of the promise that she's made above that she is taking. Uh, she wants to repeat it as often as feels good to her, but before you fall asleep, right before you fall asleep, right upon waking and during after meditation are some of the best times to access the subconscious mind. I love this. You just told us how to completely reprogram or get in alignment our subconscious mind with what we want. I think this is just genius. And I just want to say uh, a personal testament to your work that you and I have known each other for years. Um, I've worked with you in several different capacities, but uh, this stuff works. I will tell you that I've worked with Kathy on a number of different occasions and it is so amazing what happens when you approach yourself in this gentle way because that's one of the things that I really love about what you teach is it's not about fighting yourself and it's not about force or pushing through. It's about gentle introspection and it's a really wise way to approach getting what you want. Um, I just think it's genius. Yeah, and capitalizing on the wisdom that exists within you, with, which isn't just your ego and your consciousness. Like you're brilliant. There's a lot of power there. There's a lot of intelligence there, but you can also make use of of a greater amount of of wisdom and insight that's within you too. So that's why I work that way. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so for everyone watching, let's review from the top sure. um, our five steps to reprogramming, is that, okay, is that an okay phrase yeah. to call it? Yeah, our getting your conscious on board. On board with our conscious goals. So step one? Step one is to, after you recognize, is to be humble. Be humble, awesome. Step two? Get specific. Get specific, so we wanna get the specific details about what that fear is and really interview our subconscious and know specifically what, what those fears are. Mm -hmm. Step three? Step three is to make a promise. Mm -hmm. So make a commitment to yourself that you're not going to go there if it's going to mean uh, all those bad things that perhaps you were afraid of. You're only going to get the thing that you want in the way that's going to feel the best for you and it's going to be in alignment. Right. Step four. Step four is to find examples. Find examples. Exemplary so, examples. Exemplary examples. I love that. That's really key. So really look around. And we can look around to anyone, whether it's figures in history, someone we know, yeah. someone we don't know. You can even be the first example on this planet to do it that way. And I, and I really do encourage people to do so, so that they provide an example for the rest of us. Very cool. So that was step four and step five? Step five is to solidify and affirm. Solidify and affirm. And you said some of the best times to do that are before we go to bed or after or before meditation. Yeah, or right upon waking. Awesome. I mean, when, we, when I read this chapter in the audiobook, I was literally almost <gasps> as I read it. And uh, I said to my team afterwards, we need to re-record that. They were like, are you kidding me? So let's see if I can get through this. <sighs> Dreams don't disappear. You were born with them and they are, I can say I can't even get through this. <laughs> Dreams don't disappear. You were born with them and they are meant for you. That means you take them with you wherever you go in whatever version of yourself you create. So you might as well stop running and start leaning into them. You might as well see and hear and feel all the clues of your life that it's trying to give you about who you're destined to be. We are called in different ways to be the best and highest versions of ourselves. We want a high-five marriage. We want to be high-five parents. We want high-five friendships and a high-five career. Wherever there is a dream in your life, trust that you can high-five your way to it. And know that I'm still right here beside you, and so is Marie raising our hand in celebration with you. High five, my friend. We see you. We believe in you. Now it's your turn to believe in yourself and go make your dreams come true. <laughs> Hi, Marie. I'm just about to turn 19. Even though I'm young, I have big dreams. Problem is, people keep telling me my dreams are not realistic and that I'm letting myself down. I was going to be a doctor and then decided that wasn't really what I wanted. Now I want to be a professional event and party planner and grow my business into something huge that I can be proud of. How can I get past caring so much about what others think? Should I play it safe and get a degree in something that has a secure job at the end of it? What's your advice for young people just starting out in the business world? There's so much I don't know and your YouTube channel is really helping me. Thank you.
Paige, these are awesome questions, and I think it's something that all of us can relate to no matter what age we are. So the first thing I want to talk about is what you shared. Should I get a degree with a secure job at the end of it? So little reality check for you, my love. Those days are over. <laughs> There's really no such thing as a secure job anymore. Um, I think if you take a look around at what's happening in the world, you go into any Starbucks and you'll see some uh, lawyers and some stockbrokers networking out of there who would totally back me up on this. Paige, I know you said you want to start your own business and that's awesome, but for everyone else, even if you don't want to start your own business, hear me on this. Entrepreneurship is a mindset that everyone on the planet needs. If you want to thrive now and in the future, the only people that are going to really make it in this world are people that will take initiative, that will take action, and that think and behave like entrepreneurs. And one of the first and most important things about that is getting real comfortable with not giving a flying fudge what other people think about you. Let me take you back in my own life. I was only a few years older than you when I decided that I wanted to be a life coach. Now you gotta get this. This was back when no one even heard of a life coach. Those words life coach made as much sense to people as dream farmer or potato doctor. And exhale. You still getting baked? Just turn your head and cough for me. Plus, I was 23 years old. I mean, who in their right mind would hire a 23-year-old life coach? Even I was rolling my eyes at myself. The point is, don't let anyone's bullshit opinions or judgments about what you can't do, especially your own, stop you from following your dreams. You will never do anything great in your life if you've got this song stuck in your head. Judging us, they're judging you. They judge your every move And judging us They're judging you Judging us They're judging you, judging you, judging you, judging you Paige, you say you want to plan parties and events, so get to it, woman. Don't wait for people to give you permission or until you have some degree. Just find somebody who needs a party plan and plan the confetti out of it. And then you do another, and then another, and then another, and then all of a sudden... Mazel tov! You are a party planner. Now, in terms of education, I am 100% for education. In fact, I always advocate for people to be lifelong learners. But don't limit your education to only what you can learn in the classroom. You should consider getting a job or two with more established event planners so you can really learn about the industry from the inside out. And then there's one more thing, and this is my final and perhaps more important piece of advice. You've got to be really conscious of who you surround yourself with. you got to get rid of everybody who's negative and all the naysayers. So if that means getting some new friends, definitely do it. And you also want to feed yourself some really positive things to your mind and your body and your soul day after day. So I know you love Marie TV because it's a positive, wholesome, family kind of show. And of course, it's gluten-free. So remember, keep surrounding yourself with positive people. In fact, you should find some people your age and get inspired by them. Everybody knows I'm a huge fan of Malala Yousafzai, who is your age, Paige. And there's also another incredibly inspiring young woman. Her name is Tavi Gevinson. You can find entrepreneur groups in your area. You can find them online. The bottom line here is that with the right support and the right attitude and a ton of action, you can create anything you desire. Oh my goodness, that was so fun. Now, if you love this episode, you're going to love this next one even more because it goes even deeper. So enough talking, click watch now, and I'll see you there. When we're all together at our team retreats and we're doing major brainstorming, we go around and have everyone finish the sentence, wouldn't it be great if... <laughs>